This is George Kroos, and welcome back to another epic book review. Hey everyone, it is George Kuros and I'm doing another epic book review today. And interestingly enough, I was actually supposed to report record a podcast uh, with somebody and uh, they actually lead a school district and something came up very last second. They couldn't actually join me. And so I found out literally at the last second that I wasn't able to record. And so I could be really frustrated about that. But I actually have a list of things I need to do. And one of the things I had on the list was to do this podcast. So I just said, okay, what's the next thing I should do? And the next thing is to do a epic book review. All right. So <laughs> I actually, and the reason I bring that up is because it is on this book by Trevor Moad. It's called Getting to Neutral. And it's very shiny if you're watching on YouTube, which you should be watching on YouTube. Uh, if you can, I would love to hear your comments, any thoughts you have on the book. Obviously, please like and subscribe. The more I can grow this channel, the more I connect with people. Hopefully, you can give them some uh, good ideas. And so the reason I, again, bring this up is there's a question that keeps coming over uh, in this book, Getting to Neutral. And it's basically, what's the next best thing I could do? You know, when you have a tough situation or something negative has happened in your life, uh, when things don't go your way, and today things didn't go my way because I was planning on doing a podcast, didn't work out, said I had no emotion about it, understood someone else's situation because they're obviously got things that they have to do that are more important than recording this podcast, which is totally fine with me. And I just, I have tons of things I can do. So I, here I am recording this podcast. And it is a really interesting book and it pushed my thinking and I like to think of myself as a very positive person. And what I mean by that is not positive in the sense that I just always am happy and nothing could ever go wrong. And I always look for the bright side in things. But the way that I see being positive is I connect that word to the idea of moving forward, right? It, positive steps uh, in a specific direction. So a lot of times we can hear people just constantly complaining, having issues. And I don't think that ever gets people anywhere closer to a solution when there are negative things that are happening in our lives, in the world. So I've always seen this idea of being positive as not pretending problems don't exist, but actually figuring out solutions to those problems. So why this book had pushed me uh, when I'm reading this idea, getting to neutral, is Trevor Moad, and he actually uh, wrote this book, passed away um, with cancer. Uh, and it's interesting because he, he actually writes about his cancer diagnosis, how he's dealing with that. And he actually applies many of the lessons um, in his book to his own life and to his own current situation and how he deals with things. And so he talks about this concept of getting to neutral and he keeps saying this thing over and over again. And it's the concept of like, what does the situation require of me? Like, what's the next best thing I can do? So I can kind of see how, you know, my focus and how I see being positive and how Moad's idea of getting to neutral are very similar. I, I, the reason I say this challenges me is because I'm very cognizant that the way people see positivity uh, might actually be detrimental to the way that I see positivity. And so when I look at this notion of getting to neutral, it's very solution focused. And a, a concept that I've heard about a ton, and you hear it a lot on social media, you hear from um, you know people in education quite a bit, you hear it outside of education is this notion of toxic positivity. And I'll tell you, when I hear that term, I, and I'm being very blunt about it, it's often from people that are seem to be very negative focused that they will just label stuff as toxic positivity as a way to shut people up. And do I believe toxic positivity is a thing? Absolutely. And here is the example. And I've used this. You've, if you listen to this podcast any length of time, you've heard me say this, but I think it's good um, to, especially in this context, here's how I see toxic positivity. If I am sitting in the middle of my house and my house starts burning down 
And I say to myself, ooh, it's nice and warm in here. That's toxic positivity. I get it, right? You're pretending a negative situation doesn't exist. And in fact, you're not only just pretending, you're almost saying like the negative situation is actually good. There's a little bit of gaslighting um, in that process as well. So when I see the notion of what do we do when the house is burning down, my focus on positive and maybe Moad's focus on, uh, you know, getting to neutral is, hey, the house is burning down. What do I need to do to solve this issue? Like focusing on that. And that's how I see is, you know, what is the positive thing that we can do to move forward? And Moad's focus on how we actually address the situation and ask ourselves, what's the next best thing? Uh, and I think part of the reason I really think of this, that's how I, I've always thought of positive um, thinking is really connected to this quote from Mark and Angel. And I, I, I love this. I've shared it a million times. And it's simply this. Being positive does not mean ignoring the negative. Being positive means over, overcoming the negative. There is a big difference between the two. And so again, you, you hear the Mark and Angel quote that I just shared with you all. And then you think of the notion of Trevor Moad's f focus on getting to neutral, very similar in their thinking. But I, I always try to think about, um, you know, how do we bring people closer to this type of thinking? And, and that's why I actually really like the idea of getting to neutral is because it, it makes people think differently about, you know, the word positive actually maybe removes the word positive and gets them to focus on being really solution focused. Now, before I get into the quotes I really like, there is one quote that I, I kind of laughed at because I actually thought about it and um, I was like, yeah, that's totally right. And then I was like, mm, actually, that's not right. And it was basically talking about how people can be focused on negativity, constantly tear you down. And it was simply this quote, that there's never been a statue of a critic. And I was like, that's true. There has never been a statue of a critic, right? And one of the things that I've talked about, and I've shared this quote, you know, I wrote this myself, is if I had to choose between the notion of being a creator or a critic, I would always choose to be a creator, right? And when you become someone who creates content, when you share this podcast, when you share your thinking, you are more susceptible, obviously, to actually, you know, being criticized. Uh, a lot of times I get criticized on my blog and share, and then I'll say like, hey, I'd love to read your blog. Um, do you know, as an example of the criticism you're loving on me, how you actually deal with it? And a lot of times they're like, well, I don't have a blog. And I'm like, I know, that's why I asked the question. <laughs> so, you know, like there, there's a reasoning. I, I do that sometimes. And I know that can be, you know, sound petty. And sometimes it is because sometimes I want people to understand, like it is very hard to put yourself in a situation. And um, when you criticize someone for doing something, you know, like I... One of the things that really, and I know this is going off on a tangent, one of the things that really bugs me is when I go to uh, basketball games and I watch the refs and you can see the instant replay and you can see, you know, fans, there will be a call and fans will start booing and then I'll watch the replay on the screen in front of me. And it's like, well, everyone just saw that and the ref was right and they'll still boo, Right. And that's kind of thinking is that there is a bias is that like you don't do the thing that I want. It's not that I actually criticize you. It's that you don't do what I want you to do. And that's the criticism, not that you didn't do the right thing. And that's a lot of times, you know, when people are creating is, you know, a lot of times people criticize because they want to control others. And so going back to this quote, there's never been a statue of a critic. I was like, mm, Roger Ebert, I'm sure there's a statue of him. Roger Ebert, I, as a kid, I, you know, I still love movies. Uh, Siskel and Ebert, I used to watch them all the time. And uh, I, I would guarantee somewhere, even a mini statue of Roger Ebert. So, you know, I'm sure some people have made a, a good living out of being, you know, being giving uh, critics of movies or things like that. So it's not always true. I just, I just wanted to share. I thought it was kind of funny. Anyways, I'm going to get to the summary of the book and then share three favorite quotes that I have from this book and just some, you know, some of my own context in this. So I actually went to do a book summary in chat GPT and this book is written, I think, uh, after 2021, I, I'm, I'm not really sure of the exact date, but the reason I know is after 2021 is because when I actually looked it up and let's see, oh, it's 2022. 
ChatGPT said, oh, I actually have no information on that book because of it wasn't published in 2021. I was like, what? I, I didn't know. I thought you just know instantly. So there's a issue with ChatGPT. So I actually just looked up um, the summary from HarperCollins, the publisher of the book. And having read the book myself, uh, it's accurate. And so uh, here's what they say on the summary. It's easy to be positive when everything is coming up roses. But what happens when life goes sideways? Many of us lapse into a self-defeating negative spiral that makes it hard to accomplish anything. Getting to Neutral is a step-by-step -step guide that shows readers how to use mental conditioning coach Trevor Moad's innovative motivational system to defeat negativity and thrive. Neutral thinking is a judgment-free, process-oriented approach that helps us coolly assess situations in high-pressure moments. Moad walks readers through how to downshift to neutral no matter how dire the situation. He shows us how to behave our way to success, how to determine and practice our values in a neutral framework, and how to surround ourselves with a team that helps us to stay neutral. Filled with raw, inspiring stories of how Trevor navigated health challenges with neutral thinking, as well as insights drawn from some of the world's best athletes, coaches, and leaders, getting to neutral will help readers learn to handle even the most complex and turbulent situations with calm, calm clarity, and resolve. So that, that is pretty accurate. Um, there is a theme that keeps going on over and over again is like, what does the situation require of me? And uh, there, there's a lot of great ideas in this book, a lot of really, um, really hard, like I guess mo emotional stories because of Moad's situation. His, his father also passed away. Um, and so he was a speaker and he's helped a lot of high level athletes, high, you know, high level sports programs, um, and gone outside of, uh, the sports, uh, complex as well. So I want to share a few quotes that really resonate with me and, uh, and one actual like passage and cause it kind of walks through the step. So the first one, this, the first quote I'm going to share is the following. The next time your world feels like it's collapsing around you, grab your mental gear shift and ask yourself something similar. Don't worry about the big picture. Ask this, what is the next thing I need to do? So I, I highlight these quotes. I highlight them in my notes app on my phone. And then I'll like write down, like here are some quotes that resonate. And then I thought about, and then I, I, when I'm writing my notes for this podcast, I connect a story. Like what's a story that I think of when... I read this specific quote. And I can tell you the very first one that came to my mind was COVID. And when I, what I mean by that is basically in March of 2020, uh, everyone's life had changed, including mine. And everyone's life changed in different ways, no matter uh, what they were doing, their personal situation, their professional situation. And so the way my life had changed was I was constantly on the road, nonstop. And I all of a sudden get everything canceled. I'm not going anywhere, airports are shut down. And I'll tell you, when the first flight got canceled and my first conference got canceled, my very first thing was, oh my God, like what are we gonna do? This is terrifying as a family. Uh, you know, this is literally what I do for a living and now that living is, is disappeared. So I kinda was just thrown off. And then I actually thought about the next day, hey, I'm the guy who wrote Innovator's Mindset. And the whole focus on innovation is finding solutions, new and better ways of doing things. If I can't figure what to do next, then I really don't live what I mean. So the next day I sat in my office, similar to this office, and I started figuring out a plan, started figuring out things that I could do immediately. And not only for my own family, but how could I help other, you know, groups, other people that were going through tough times. So I spent a lot of time with schools, kind of advising them, uh, you know, doing little Q and A's, putting together some blog posts, putting together some podcasts, things I thought could actually help. And so that was the way I dealt with it. And then if you go even further into COVID, I actually, you know, a lot of people had gained weight, during COVID, I was already, to be honest with you, in the obese range, and I had put on extra weight. And then I started to actually use this Lumen device. They're not advertising. They're not promoting this. I've worked with them because of the success I've had using the thing, but they they don't know I'm mentioning this right now. And I started to actually assess my metabolism, things like that. And one day, it asked me to record my weight. 
And I hadn't actually got on a scale probably in three or four years. And so I remember specifically thinking like, oh my God, this is, I, I'm terrified. So I had to wait in my mind that I was going to be and was terrified to see it on the scale. And then I got on the scale and I was like 40 pounds heavier than that weight. So it's like, oh my God. And I remember going into my bed, laying there and I basically started crying because I was like, what is the situation that I've got in? And and then I actually got up and basically said, I got to fix my eating. This is what I got to do. I got to fix my eating. My eating is terrible. And I assess this. And there's a lot of times we say, well, this is causing the problem. This is causing the problem. And we point to external things that we have no control over. So I have to ask, like, what's the thing that I can actually do right now? And basically from that moment, my, I said, what can I do today that I can maintain two, three years from now, which I actually do, and follow that guideline. I don't want to go on some crash diet that I know is going to just get me back in the same situation. I need to change my lifestyle. So just basically facing the situation sometimes, actually saying like, here is the problem. Here is the issue. Because if you don't actually acknowledge the issue, you can't find a solution. So I acknowledge the issue and said, okay, what is a solution that I can only start right now, but can maintain? And that's, you know, a lot of people know, uh, I see, you know, uh, Tom Murray actually shared a video of me on a podcast um, from 2020 and he shared it. And I was like, I don't recognize that person. And it's the same person. And to be honest with you, at that time, I had already started sol- like fixing some of my issues, but it, it just is a different person because, when you actually are very solution focused, it changes things. It will force you to change yourself. And so that's what I thought of when I, I read that quote specifically. Basically, what is the situation? Uh, like actually acknowledging the negative thing that's happening in your life and then saying, what can I do next? All right, so quote two, and this is more of a, 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 a quote, um, a, a passage. And I, I really, this is why I want to share it because He actually, Moed talks about how to kind of deal with like a bully at work. And I I, I liked it. I like how he kind of says like, here's the things you could do and here's why they wouldn't work, right? So here's what he says. So let's uh, practice identifying that next step using a hypothetical situation. Imagine you've got a terrible coworker who bullies you every day and who is booing, who is being exceptionally merciless today. First day reading. Uh, This person just unleashed a torrent of insults on you and you need to choose the next right step right now. These are the wrong questions to ask. Why is this person doing this to me? Okay. Well, there may be a time to examine this issue more deeply later, but at the moment, the reason doesn't matter. How do I get out of here? You have just as much right to be there as your bully. Don't let them chase you away. What can I say to make them feel as bad as they're making me feel? Escalating the situation will only make it worse. Uh, a lot of times, and just kind of an aside here, I had a good friend who is kind of basically um, getting, in, you know, social media recently, he was getting attacked, you know, for something he actually didn't do. And he was going back and forth. They said, every time you do that, you're actually bringing more of an audience and more of attention. And it's actually kind of fueling the situation and it's not actually solving your problem. It's actually making it worse. So Moag goes, the correct question to ask in this or any other stressful predicament is the following. What does this situation require of me? So again, there's a theme obviously throughout the book, getting to neutral. You can see it in the link down below in the description. So first story I thought when I read this, um, I was actually uh, refing a college basketball game years ago. And I remember this, this is very, uh, one of my very first few college games. And basically how it works is, you know, you get moved up levels. So you start with at the middle school, junior high level. If you're, if you can handle that, they'll move you up to high school. If you're really good at that, they'll move you up to college. And that's how people get basically to the NBA. So I was on a path and I was really excited about this. So one of my very first few college games, I'm with some very veteran referees and they have what's called three person and two person. Two person is done for, you know, high school games, three person, because there's so much going on. Um, you actually have to have not two referees, but three going on in the game. So this is also a new process for me. And these two people I'm refing with are, are veterans. So this game is played in quarters. And the first quarter, I literally do not have a call. 
I don't have a call. And the second quarter, still don't have a call. And there is a play that happened in front of me. And I'm like, I got to do something. I got to show that I'm actually a part of this game. And sometimes it just happens that nothing happens in your area. So all of a sudden, I actually made a foul call, which was a terrible call. It was a bad call. And I knew that in the moment, uh, the person goes to shoot free throws. The coach starts yelling at me. He starts yelling at me in the situation. And I remember that. And I said to him, coach, the next stoppage in play, I'll talk to you, right? Because you can't talk during the game because then you're going to miss a bunch of other calls. You're going to make more mistakes. So what does the situation require of me? I need to just stop him, get him to calm down for a second and acknowledge that I will talk to him, you know, when time permits. So he's so mad that he calls a timeout. He's like, I'm, then I'm going to create a stoppage in play. So he calls a timeout. I go over to my refing partners, knowing I've screwed up, right? And they know I screwed up. And they said to me, don't go over there. I said, no, I'm, I'm fine. Don't worry, I'm good. So I go over there. Ref is, the coach is about to start yelling at me. And I remember saying to him, coach, there's no issue. There's no reason you need to, to yell at me right now. Because I agree with you, that was a terrible call. And he looked at me and he's like, all right. And he never said anything. That was it. Because me simply acknowledging that I had made a mistake. And then I actually said after, I promise you I'll be better. I'm sorry about that call. Me acknowledging the mistake and actually saying I will address this. So to move forward was all that he wanted. Because what is he going to say to I made a terrible call? Yeah, he did. Well, yeah, I just agreed with you, right? And sometimes we let our ego get in the way where sometimes the, the best thing to actually do, the next best thing to do is say like, hey, I made a mistake. Here's how I'm going to remedy it. And it actually solves the issue moving forward. And I just remember that because a lot of times, um, you know, in our professional lives, a lot of people will make mistakes and they will just kind of double down on them. And they won't acknowledge them. And not only does it actually leave the person the mistake has done to, um, in a worse situation, but it also affects your credibility. I had more credibility when I could just say, yeah, I made a mistake. Yeah. Just like sometimes when you have an open layup, you miss, you know, you don't want to, but it happens. Right. And that was really important for me in that situation was to acknowledge it. Just tell him I was going to move forward, solve the situation right away. Never had an issue with the coach ever. And I repped him several games. And I think he had a respect for me because not all reps were willing to do that. Just like not all educational leaders to say like, hey, you know what? We probably are making a mistake here. Maybe we need to kind of calm down some of the things that we're doing, or maybe we need to kind of take a step back and reassess because are we making the situation worse by doubling down or we need to step back and, you know, say like, hey, yeah, we made a mistake. We need to go in a different path. All right. Final quote. This is from the end of the book and it really resonated with me. And wherever you are on your life's path, I hope that after reading this book, you accept all that's happened because you also know that none of what has happened in the past predicts the future. Every moment, it's its own adventure. So you own that next moment and the next and the next. and You keep going. What I thought about when I read this quote. I was so obsessed when, you know, in my career on becoming a principal when I was assistant principal I basically had one day as a assistant principal and I knew by the second I want to be a principal. So I spent a lot of my time basically focusing on that next step in my career. And what actually happens when you do that, when you're so focused on what's happening in the future, or sometimes when you're so stuck on what's happened in the past, you're actually not making the best out of the present moment and assessing this. And I was offered a job um, as a principal, you know, early on, and I just knew it wasn't the right fit for me. And I was terrified that me saying no to something that I wanted, because there's so many other factors in that situation that weren't good for me at the time, uh, where it was, you know, what it would do for my mental health, uh, because of the, the increase in drive time, just a bunch of other factors. I was terrified. And what I actually stepped back and reassessed is if I'm an assistant principal at this school that I truly love with people I truly love and I don't take a principalship, is that actually a horrible thing? Sometimes just assessing and appreciating the situation that you're in because it's good. Like now, if your situation's horrible, that's a different story. 
But sometimes we actually don't acknowledge the good we're in right now because we're so obsessed on making the future better. But what I have learned over and over and over again is basically when you focus on doing the best thing that you need to do in the situation, the future will take care of itself. I focused on being the best assistant principal. I, I stopped focusing on becoming a principal. I focused on becoming the best assistant principal I could possibly be. And because of my performance, that actually opened up a job as a principal way quicker than if I would have actually been obsessed with becoming a principal and focus solely on that. When I became a principal, I was way better at it. And I was so focused on being the best principal I could be. All of a sudden, a, an opportunity opened up where I started speaking and then started, you know, um, helping other uh, leaders in the school district, doing something I, I couldn't even imagine that was there. I'd always want to be a superintendent. I remember having a conversation with one of my former superintendents who was absolutely amazing. And she said to me, uh, I don't think you're going to be a superintendent. It's not because you don't have the ability, but because I just see different things for you. And I didn't have any clue what that would be, but she saw something I didn't. So I just focused on doing the best what I could at the moment. So wherever you are right now and whatever you're doing, it's great to have those aspirations, those goals that we strive for. But for me, you know, I, there's certain per, uh, fitness goals I have. There's certain personal goals I have. There's certain professional goals I have. The thing and what I love about getting neutral by Trevor, Trevor Moad is really kind of focusing not like what is next in 10 years from now. It is actually what is the best thing we can do right now in this situation. And that doing it over and over again, as Moad says, it actually leads to a better future. Uh, my friend Katie Novak, uh, co-author of Innovate Inside the Box, one of the things I said, she said to me, and I'll always remember, she said, just remember that this year for your grade three students, this is their one year in grade three. So we want to make sure that's the best experience possible. And so a lot of schools are focused on their 10 year plans, you know, what we're doing in the future. And none of our kids care about that 10 year plan. They want the best experience right now. And so I really appreciated some of the thinking, some of the connections personally, professionally, how this connects to education. Uh, I would really recommend this book. And I think it's a really great opportunity for a book study to kind of situation, especially if you find yourself um, in a maybe a school culture or community that really gets stuck on negativity. And I've seen that quite a bit. And not that it's not um, justified, to be honest with you. But continuously being negative actually probably won't help the situation. We have to figure out ways that we can find solutions to our current problems to make the future better. And that's what I really got out of this book. So Trevor Moad's Getting to Neutral, uh, powerful book, really liked it. It was a TikTok recommendation and, you know, that's, that's how I decided to get books now. But I, I, I recommend it. Check it out in the, the description down below. Thanks so much for um, joining me here today. And, uh, you know, things didn't work out that I was supposed to have a podcast. Now I got another one recorded, so I'm excited for that. And I hope that it helped you. I hope you have a wonderful day. Well, thanks for joining me for another Epic book. All right. Have a wonderful day. Take care.